Hello, this is Will Faber, and today we're looking at a second submission by Victoria of her horse, Vinny. Vinny is a 10-year-old quarter horse that she's been working with for a while, the second submission we've seen. In the last submission, um, he wasn't swinging enough over his back and not stretching a great deal, but we see here already that it's a little better. Now, I would like to see just a little more activity in that walk, but you're doing a better job here with the lunge line in the last video than you were in the last video in that he's saying more consistent out at the end of the line away from you. Now we just need to get him to work a little more actively. I think the use of the sham bone here is a good call for this horse. And should certainly help him stretch out quite a bit more as time goes on here. But once again, this is a better walk than what we saw in the last video. Still needs to be a little more active, better than it was a moment ago. And what you want to find, whether it's on the lunge line or riding, is we get the sense of, of um, you know, sending him through to the bridle, so to speak, and getting a more consistent flow of the energy through the body of the horse. So once again, here he just needs to be a little more active and away from you. Though once again, this is better than the last video when we saw he was uh, your, rhino, your line was loose most of the time. But this is much better, and you're getting some good moments of stretch by virtue of it. We just need to try to get it more consistent um, in terms of your circle there, trying to hold your ground a little more or walk with him, but try to get a more precise circle rather than, you see how when you let go like that, he kind of brings his head way out to the outside, and then you have to take contact and kind of pull him around. So continue to work on this uh, concept of getting contact with the horse on the lunge line. Though so this is a much better stretch now. That's better than anything I saw in the last video. So this is showing me a lot of improvement here. You could probably put that sham bone just a little bit tighter now um, that he's starting to respond to it and he's not overreacting. So a little tighter on the sham bone might be good. So here on the lunge line, you can see how he's, his body is going on two different circles. He's pulling to the outside with his shoulders all the time. So he's really got his shoulders on one circle and his hindquarters the other. The same thing here. He's kind of pulling to the outside. You see what I'm talking about? They're almost counter flexing. So you need to get a more consistent contact yet with the rein there. And then try to move him away from you with the lunge whip. That is, move his hindquarters out till it's on the same circle as the forehand. That's what horses will do to uh, evade having to come underneath themselves or work a little bit harder. They just throw the shoulder to the outside so they're not really required to step very deeply under themselves. Um, so that's what we not got to do is get him moving that hindquarters away from you a little bit more in the lunge line as you do there. And once you get that, then he starts to stretch a little better. But once again, look how long that neck actually is right there. Now that's really good. This is the best stretch I've seen out of him yet. And once again, your problem is you come around the corner there and you're not keeping enough uh, consistent contact. So he kind of throws his shoulder back out there. But you got it be back much better that time. So this is a much better swing. And, you know, once again, it's surprising when you see a horse like this and you see their next, when they finally actually start to stretch from the shoulder, how much different the horse looks and how much longer its neck looks. Like when you saw, first saw this horse, his neck looked very short. But his neck really, it wasn't short. He was just, you know turtling it back into his body and not letting his whole top line stretch. So this is really good and a huge improvement over what we saw on the last tape as far as the stretch goes and everything else. So again, same thing there. You see how he kind of pulls the outside, but that time you corrected him quite quickly. And once again, that's the reason that we want to have that unbroken line to the horse's mouth, as well as the fact that, you know, if you have a lot of slack in the line, the horse suddenly takes off, they can pull you right off your feet. So you want to be able to react to what the horse is doing, just like when we ride. You know, when people see us stretching, they say, oh, you're riding around on a loose rein. No, we're not riding around. We're riding around on a light contact, but that we're still in contact in the stretch. It's not riding a horse around on a loose rein. It's just getting the horse to stretch into the contact. And that's basically what you're getting done here. It's so again, a little, little slack in the rein there, but you're doing a so much better job. And this is such a good trot. Now, this is, this is really the important work that you're doing. When you get him into that really deep stretch the way you had a few moments ago there, that's really what we're looking for. And that's where we build the muscle. Once again, people have to get over this idea. And I've even heard top trainers you know, say this, oh, that you have to pull a horse's neck back in or they'll never develop. Well, that's, nothing could be further from the truth. That, that will only develop them in the wrong way. So really good trot there. There's what you're striving for. So there's what we would like to see under saddle as well as on the lunge line, what I just saw right there. 
but you know since the last video that i saw that's a huge huge improvement even coming back to the walk once again he has a nice long stretching walk could be a little bit more active but once again look how beautiful the neck looks when it stretches out and you see that underside of the neck when the horse gives up all those muscles once again, whenever you see a horse that's, that's very thick on the underside of its neck, that's a horse that's basically been pulling with its shoulders to sole life, or U-necked as we call it. But that's not necessarily the horse's conformation. That's the thing you have to realize, that you know, any horse that's not working over its back, when it starts working over its back, is going to look like a very different horse, a more expensive one. <laughs> so that's a good note to take. But a horse like this over the first two years, and once again, why it's so important, you know. Uh, today, we're breeding some pretty amazing horses, you know, that look almost as if they're trained, you know, because their conformation is so good. They're so uphill and everything is right. But even those horses, uh, as we see all the time from so many of these uh, uh, top-level horses that are going lame so quickly and their careers being so short, because, you know, they're very beautiful horses with good uh, confirmation, but the fact they're never trained right, everything just goes downhill just like it will for your horse, and the backs start to drop, and they start getting kissing spine and all this stuff, and it doesn't take that long. It's amazing how much damage, you know, we can do to horses um, <laughs> doing bad dressage. As I always say, you know, there's nothing better for a horse for, than dressage, correct dressage, but there's nothing worse for it than bad dressage where people are trying to constantly force the horse against the hand. A really good stretch there. That's coming really nicely once again. And your whole lunging technique is so much better this time around. And once again, you see that hole there. You see how he's behind the saddle there, how that's dipped. That's going to all fill in when you get him working well here. And once again, over that two-year period that it takes to put a foundation on the horse, a horse like this, his withers will stretch up through the shoulders, and he will become a much more uphill-looking horse. It will, in fact, be one. So we got to a good place in the other direction that was really good. And once you start to be able to get that, of course, you want to be able to keep it longer and longer because that's where the muscling occurs. That's where we develop muscle, so to speak. <clears throat> so starting out here, same thing. You can see how he's kind of pulling his shoulders to the outside. So watch him come around that corner. So you see how he's pulling his head to the outside and his hindquarters towards you, as well as the fact that the horse is trying to get its hindquarters at you. You know, they can, they're can they usually, as I say, loading their guns against you, like, you know, a warning, come at me and I'm going to kick you. That's what they do to each other in the field. So you want to get those hindquarters pushed away from you a little more. But this is a really good stretch that you're getting here now. And once again, this is that's where you want it, right there. That's where you want to spend as much time as possible. So we want to gauge everything else that we do based on that. If this is the only place where you know we can get him into that phase, then we want to do more of this and less of whatever it is when he's not. In other words, some of the some of the riding work that I see you do is you know is just not up to this level and is not quite getting there. So, you know, work him where you can get him all the way there, and then try those other things. As you often hear me talk about the canner, you know. Uh, I don't want you not to ever canter your horse, but I want you to try it every now and then. If it's hollow, I want you to go back to working the trot till we build more strength. As I said, we don't build a better canter by cantering more. We build a better canter by getting the horse over its back and developing the muscles that allow him to canter correctly. So we just don't want to spend any time doing things badly because everything that we do badly, we have to undo at some point. So once we can get the horse working over its back, we want to base everything else that we do on that. So that's a good stretch there. That's really wonderful. Now, if he does this on the lunge line, it won't be long be before you're getting it under saddle. But, you know, sometimes horses are just too weak and we get up on them and their backs collapse and they simply cannot get into the stretch because their back has collapsed so much. So with those horses, we have to work much more from the ground. So same thing here, once again, in terms of that, you can see how, once again, he's, you're, he's pushing the hindquarters at you. See how he comes around the corner there and the forehand is pulled way outside the circle. So get your concentration more on watching the back end of the horse and make it, getting that moving away from you and being sure that you have both ends of the horse on the same circle. In fact, we can even bring the forehand in a little bit at times if we want to, to do a little shoulder in on the, on the uh, lunge line, which we can do. But this is, once again, a much better trot other than the fact that he's pulled out a little bit with the shoulders, but he's certainly stretching. See how beautifully his neck is starting to light up on the top side of his neck. And that's what we want to do. So if you find that you can't get this done on, on the under saddle, rather, um, I would do more of it this way and then try it under saddle, as I was saying before. You know, before long, you'll be able to get this. But sometimes it simply tells us that the horse is you know, simply uncomfortable with weight on its back and it just simply can't stretch because the back drops too much. 
So once again, we have to just build that strength. But once again, this is a huge improvement over what I saw in the last video. You're actually getting him over his back here and uh, achieving quite a bit. So that was good on the lunge line. As I said, you know, once you get him into that stretch, uh, do a little more of that, spend a little more time with it. You know, once you get it there, try to keep it consistent. I'd like to see it get to the point where he gets there very quickly on the lunge line and, and you have five or so minutes of just keeping him over his back and it gets really consistent in the zone. Remember, that's the other thing we're doing on the lunge line is teaching the horse to sort of lock into the work and stay there and, uh, until we ask him to do something different. And the, the lunge is a very important uh, part of training a horse to be able to do that. So starting out here in the walk, this is not bad. Um, not as good as it was, obviously, the stretch on the lunge line, but um, it's coming along pretty well here. So he could be a little more active there. So the same thing is true here when we're riding. It's the same principle. We want to feel that impulse that we create with our legs and send that forward. Otherwise, you have a pretty nice position there. I would like to see you just maybe flatten your backs and stretch yourself up just that little bit more. But really, your position is quite good. I don't see any major problems here with that. <clears throat> you have a nice long leg down this horse. You know, the hardest thing um, in riding, if you are very short, is uh, you know you must have a horse like you see with this one. Your leg is long enough that your heel is down below the break of the side. In other words, where the horse's side starts to go back in again and round down to the bottom. He also pulled up his abdominal muscles right there pretty nicely, so that shows me that walk is improving. I didn't see that in the last in the last video. So even though he's not stretched as far down as he might be here. Um, the walk is getting more active and swinging. You can still see the underside of the neck there. Once again, compare what you see here with what you saw at those good moments on the lunge line and how that neck really extended out forward. We saw the entire underside of the neck really relax. So getting back to the point I was making about the leg there a moment ago is that, you know, you when you choose a horse for yourself, you know, you want to choose a horse that allows your heel, so to speak, to be below the break of the side of the horse. That is where the, where the side begins to curve back under. So if you can't get down below that with your heel, you'll have a very hard time ever collecting a horse. So um, buying a horse, now this horse is obviously perfectly sized for you, no problem at all. Your leg fits this horse. So I'm just pointing this out to others. So if, if you're going out to buy a horse and you're, and, you know, you're, you're a shorter type person, you know, and your leg doesn't fit all the way down, your heel doesn't come below the break in the horse's side, then you need to look at a smaller horse because that you will have a very hard time getting the horse to collect if your leg can't get down below because we have to ask the horse to lift from below, so to speak. So remember, there's three things that with the horses that your legs ask the horse to do: go straight forward, and impulse forward. That teach the horse to go laterally, but you can also bring your heel up underneath the horse and ask the horse to lift its back, which is the third and most important thing actually that the leg uh, does ultimately. You know, Oliveira used to say it's like plucking a guitar string. You know, and that uh, makes a lot of sense. You know, if you take your spur and just kind of pluck the side. You've all seen a, most people have seen a chiropractor get underneath the horse's belly with their fingers, and the horse lifts its back. Well, that's exactly what we do when we ride. Exactly the same principle. So you can chiropract your own horse, and that's kind of what this is about. You know, real dressage is about teaching the horse to carry its body in the best possible way. Um, that is the posture that allows the machine inside to work all together. In other words, the bones and muscles and everything and joints to work correctly without damage. So again, I just feel like this walk could be a little more active. It's better than I saw the walk once again in the last one, but we still need to get it a little more active and a little more swinging. See, so it kind of slows down there coming through that corner. So we'd like to see a much more swinging walk out of this horse. This is getting a little too slow to where it just seems like he's just kind of pulling himself along there. So we need much more activity than this. There you go. That's starting to look a little better there. Now remember also that you can also displace your weight a little bit to the back. So if you feel like your horse is getting sticky, you should lift your chest and come a little behind the motion, which will help your legs to encourage the horse forward. Then of course, as soon as you feel the wave come up underneath you, you can sit up. Now, once again, this is a good angle from the side here. Once again, you can see the dip in the horse's back there. That's what's going to improve over time here. But we can also see his belly is starting to pull up here a little bit. So that's a good thing. And I didn't see that in the last one so much. So he's already engaging here in the walk. That is, he's engaging his abdominal muscles upwards and his back upwards. Still needs to be a little longer in the walk and a little more active in swinging. Once again, remember, uh, go back and look at those places uh, we talked about on the lunge line when the neck was really right and how long it was. 
you know, once again, we can still see the bottom side of his neck here, but that's getting better as you're going. There, that walk is starting to increase and starting to swing a little more. So that's certainly an improvement and a much more rhythmic step than what we had before, though still just not quite deep enough. Not a bad little leg yield you're doing there. Could step over just a little bit more and once again just be a little more active. So what is the lateral work really about? When you Think about what happens when a horse steps underneath its body. It has to flex the joints of that hind leg a little more. So that's what ultimately leads to collection. But it only will lead to collection if the horse is working over its back when you do this. Because otherwise the horse's hip angles won't close in the right way. Which is what collection is. Remember the collection is the lowering of the three joints of the hind legs. And the degree to which the horse maintains that lowering. Now here this walk is looking much better. And we can see once again. And so once you start educating your eye. The lower lower his head and neck goes, the deeper track over from behind is like that. Now that's starting to look quite good. And look how much longer and active his walk is in a steady rhythm. It doesn't look so much like he's pulling his feet once again, as I always like to say, off flypaper or something behind. It's starting to be a regular walk and that's getting really good. So remember once again that once if you can get the walk right, do that. You know, if you still can't quite get the trot exactly right, just do more walk and more time on the lunge line. And then, you know, once again, just like I say about the canner, come back to it every few days or so and see how it feels, if it's getting any better and easier for you to maintain or easier for him to maintain the position. So do lots and lots of walk work if that's what you can do correctly. Slowing down here a little bit in this change of diagonal, but he's still coming forward pretty nicely. Not quite as nice as it was a moment ago, stretching into it. But once again, you're on the right track here. This walk is looking better here. You can just take a little more active feel with your fingers there, just asking them to soften a little bit. Remember, what our hands are doing, we're never asking the horse, um, we're never trying to pull the horse into a frame or pull its head down, as so many people have been taught today. You know, what we're doing is just take a little more feel than the weight of the rein. That's how we get a horse to stretch. We simply take a little more feel than the weight of the rein. And the horse will try to get out of that. And it'll try to figure out, well, why do I have this pressure on my mouth? And it will try many different things. But as soon as it starts to go down, then we release our hand. So in other words, we guide the horse towards that more comfortable position for itself. And of course, the position that will allow everything else to develop. So you could just be a little more active in that, is what I'm saying here, by taking a, by softening his mouth just a little bit more with your fingers, making them a little more active at times. So that's pretty good right there. Now he's starting to stretch into deeper, and once again, notice that every time that head goes down a little bit, how much more the back end comes through. Once again, that gave you a good shot there of, of how tented this horse's hips are, as we like to say tented. So when you see a hip like that, that's collapsing right behind the saddle, and then there's this bump that shows you the horse has not been working in its full stride. That's why it has that bump, because you've only developed a very short range of the horse's uh, musculature across its uh, hips there. Which, of course, is connected to everything. You know, once again, there are different muscles and things that conjoin to... to uh, form the top line, but we want to just think of it all as one thing. It's an easy way of thinking about it, just like a bicep. You're trying to flex it regularly across the whole length of your bicep. Well, that's what we're trying to do with the horse's back, is to get it to lift and engage equally across the whole length of its top line. I was just talking the other day about you know uh, someone who sent in a video and of their test and how the judge had written on their test, you know, horse hollow needs to be rounder in the neck. I mean, what a completely absurd comment that is and shows that whoever that judge was, you know, understands not even the most basic things about um, what dressage is. In other words, the horse must be working over its back to be con to for you to consider that you're doing dressage at all. And that must be working over its back in relaxation for that uh, dressage to be good and healthful for the horse, so to speak, and will help him develop. Yes, we can get horses over their backs by doing by rollering them and beating them up and getting them very agitated, but that work over the back will be very tense and usually end up in nothing but the horse broken at the third vertebrae. Uh, unfortunately, in the past 20 years, people have gotten fooled by these very expensive horses that just move their legs because, you know, most of us have horses like this or some degree of that sort of thing, but you know, unfortunately, dressage just turned into a thing of who could afford this year's best model, so to speak, you know, like getting your new car every year. So, you know, the sport has been developing, the, the horses have been developing. 
But unfortunately, it's kind of a funny thing, both in the jumping world as well. You know, the fact that horses are so talented these days, they're actually suffering more because people can get more out of them at a young age. And of course, that's what they try to do. And that's why we see so many young horses being burnt out these days, so many beautiful horses having to be injected and, and even, you know, many having to put down at eight years old because already every joint in their body is already destroyed by this kind of bad dressage or bad riding. I won't even call it dressage. It's just bad riding. So good swing there in that leg yield. That was quite good. Once again, a little more active here. We still like to see him stretching a little deeper in all of this. But once again, you know, compared to where I saw you last time, this is a huge improvement. And I like the fact that, you know, most of your work here was done in the walk. And that's exactly how it should be. You know, we never want to take any horse. There's no point in going into a trot if the horse can't relax in the walk. Uh, it's not going to do you any good and just going to, um, if you continue to ride like that, what happens is, you know, if you, especially if you have a hot kind of horse, they just get fitter and fitter and fitter and pretty soon they get crazier and crazier and crazier. That's why, you know, people used to th talk about how thoroughbreds horses were all crazy and they get these horses off the track and they'd be half crazy. Well, they're not. The reality was they just are too sensitive to go into the hands of many of the people who got them. I mean, if you go to the racetrack and see they people have, you know, those people know how to handle horses. I don't approve of racing horses, but I'm just talking about the fact that, you know, they go out there and you have a bunch of two-year-olds and they can, you know, gallop them down a track without them bucking off all those little riders. Well, how do you think they do that? They train them correctly to start with, not to buck. If they didn't, they'd have a big problem on their hands. And of course, the horses that run the best on the track are the ones that are running over their backs, just like everything else. That is, they're working over their backs. And a good race trainer knows the same thing that a good dressage trainer, that a good jumper trainer knows. You know, every great rider, whether they were educated to it or just stumbled onto it themselves, but it was in every case, when you see a great rider, their horses are working over their backs. They've learned what that means. I remember the great Rodney Jenkins and his educational tape and you know I don't think Rodney was a man who was um, you know he grew up as a as a whip for the hunt his father was the uh, uh, huntsman of the Orange County hunt at one time grew up doing that and just became a good natural rider had a good sense of when a horse is over his back and in his educational video he talks about in his southern drawl how you know I like a horse to get his back up underneath me now he no doesn't explain that in any way so I think it's kind of was probably something glossed over or missed by most people watching his educational video. But point being is that's the thing you want to take home. That's why his horses were going differently than the other people around him and why he was winning because he was getting these horses working over their backs. So once again, I've liked all this walk work has been so much improved over what I saw last time. You know, just those few little things that, you know, you could just be a, uh, working a little bit more with your fingers there, closing them. I can't tell exactly what you're doing there, but you're just a little too light at sometimes, kind of like on the lunge line. But of course, I'd rather that you be too light than too tight, you know, so, uh, and the horse will be certainly better off. I mean, any horse would be better off just being ridden as they used to in the hunt field. They used to put standing martingales on all the people who really didn't know how to ride horses. For that reason, just tell them, you know, leave the horse's frame alone, let it do what it wants to do, and, you know, just simply stop and go. You're better, the horse is better off that way than trying to be forced into a frame. Because there's nothing worse or more dangerous, really, than trying to horse, uh, force a horse into a frame. Because the horse is always at a balance that's forced against the hand. Forcing a horse against your hand doesn't lead to lightness. It can lead to a horse being broken at the third vertebrae and behind the bit, but it will never lead to lightness. If you hold a horse up today, you'll be holding him up for the rest of your life. Really good walk here. Once again, now this is starting to improve a little bit there as we go into the trot. But once again, good walk work. You can spend even more time doing that. And uh, I like the fact that you didn't spend a lot of time here trotting. And that's really what you should do at this point with him. Um, as you can see, you start the trot and he comes up and, it, and it's kind of hollow there. But that's going to improve. Now, I like the fact that you're, once again, you're never trying to force it down. And even the trot, though... Um, even though it's kind of hollow right there, it's a better trot than I saw on the last tape. It's more active and a little more swinging forward, which will ultimately lead to, to your goal of getting him over his back in all three gates. I like how you just tapped him there a little bit and got him active. I love the activity. The trot is just in terms of activity and moving forward. Now you can see the underside of his neck here. Once again, watching the muscling, that tells you he's kind of hollowed against you a little bit there. 
but he does get out here a little better than he did the last time that I saw him. And he's working more actively. His hind legs are even just, even though he's a little upside down here, he's still tracking better than he was in the last video that I saw. I like how you're just letting that inside hand come to the inside there a little bit. You know, once again, remember that there's many different positions that we use when we train horses. And once again, that's the biggest thing that's wrong with training today is that people are teaching people to pose on upside down horses. And then everything gets very complicated. You know, when you read about equitation, you read how the aids are supposed to work. It, they only work correctly if the horse is working over its back. If it's not, you're just going to encounter resistance. And there is where we get most people get into trouble as they, you know, have been taught to kind of fight the horse into a frame. <clears throat> And, you know, not, not to say that any horse might have a hard lesson one day or a strong lesson, as Mr. Oliveira used to say, you know, um, especially some that have gotten uh, horses that have learned and developed bad habits. But all of those things can be overcome by simply going back to the beginning and starting a horse all over. That's when you, when you, you know, uh, you realize that that's how the system works. You just back up and start all over again. So once again, still here a little hollow in that trot. Now, I probably would have come back to the walk and not even spent this much time as he's, as he's been pretty hollow. I would suggest you come back to the walk more often, get him stretching back in the walk again, and then try your trot again. But remember, what we're looking for is that trot that I showed you on the lunge line when that was really, really good. Now, that's another uh, way you can go about it, too. If you get him really stretching nicely on the lunge line, the saddle, if you have somebody that can help you, you know, it sometimes is helpful to make that transition to being lunged under saddle. That is, have somebody and and only do that with somebody who you absolutely trust that knows how to handle horses. If not, just go on doing it just the way you're doing it, because uh, uh, there's nothing worse than be the end of a mercy of somebody at the end of a lunge line who doesn't know how to lunge, and it can get you into trouble very quickly. So. Um, and also that can be very hard on the horse. But if you have that, you could try it. If he gets to the point where he's stretching really nicely as he is on the lunge line, that's a good interim step that I do with people all the time. But once again, with me handling the lunge line. So once again, that the trot was certainly better than the last time I saw it. Uh, it was more active, a little more swing in it, but never really got to where we wanted it to get to. But you did the right thing of coming back to the walk. That's exactly what you do. Don't frustrate yourself by trotting and trotting aim endlessly with the horse hollow. Just come back to the walk, and it won't be that long. You'll be amazed. At, I mean, even just the short period of time you've been doing this, there's a huge improvement between this and the last time I saw you. But like there, I would have wanted to get the horse all the way down that stretch again before I started to walk. Just really put that as, you know, your goal is you don't do anything wrong. Because every, every step we take wrong, we have to undo somewhere along the way. So I would have spent more time, got him more into the stretch and the walk before you went back to the trot. So always get one thing right before you go on to the next thing. And once you understand the order of how things go, as I say all the time, I mean, you ride well enough to train a horse if you understand how they are trained. You know, as it takes a lot of talent, as I always say, to ride badly enough to fight horses into false frames. And that's why we see so many people sidelined today by their trainers or endlessly having to buy new horses because the trainers get on, they beat the horses all up and get them all whipped up. And, you know, it looks very glamorous and, you know, spectacular to somebody who doesn't know what they're looking at. To me, it just looks like somebody torturing an animal. I don't understand it. But, uh, but as I said, you know, that's very often why we see people sidelined by their so-called trainers. You know, training a horse makes it easier to ride. It doesn't make it harder to ride. So, you know, if you have a horse in training with somebody and you used to be able to ride it and now you can't, that should tell you something about what's going on with your horse. And I have this scenario all the time. People call me and say, oh, I bought a horse that my trainer picked out. And, you know, a month later, I can't go near it. I can't ride it. And they tell me I can't I have to stay off of it. So that should tell you something's going seriously wrong. In many cases that, you know, the trainers buy horses that they want for themselves and not necessarily ones that are right for um, the person that they're supposed to be buying it for. Now this is looking better. Now this is the first time he's starting to release a little bit here. And well, but once again, if you go back and look at the trot, at least here he's, he's tracking pretty deeply underneath with the hind legs, even though he's not all the way into the stretch way we'd like. And once again, 
it's better to do this, you know, than to try to fight them into a frame. But once again, you'd want to do this for short periods of time. I've seen some good moments there. It's just not quite uh, there all the time in the trot yet, but it will be. But as I said, you want to keep your trot time, you know, to a short period. Get as best you can. Come back to the walk, reestablish it, and then try again. But this is all much improved over the last time I saw you. Once again, on the lunge line, just those few things about getting his hindquarters moving out, getting more consistently in it, and uh, keep up the good work. This is Will Faber from Art to Ride. Great job.